When Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, that freed the black slaves. But before the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, they were still enslaved. So they used the Underground Railroad, a mode, a vehicle, so to speak, to get them to freedom. Hi, I'm Justine Turner. Come with me on a journey, and I'll explain to you how they came to London, an inland city, to a very special tree. Canada is a unique place. Everybody ran from all over the world to come here for the freedom that we have. To me, the, the meeting tree is, is cracking open a bit of hidden history of Ontario and Canada that should be told but nobody talks about. It. Most of the Underground Railroad, people kept their mouth shut even years after it was over because they were afraid of reprisals. So Port Stanley to London was a long time Underground Railroad route. And again, that's something that we can document. Along that secret route, the escaped slaves would have traveled north through forests, meadows, and First Nation trails. And just as they would be approaching what we now know as downtown London, they would have came upon this majestic, over 400-year-old beacon that towers over the forest canopy. It was here that they would find their freedom. This tree provided a shelter and a safe refuge for many escaped slaves that found it on their journey to freedom. And it wasn't too long until more joined them and the birth of the black community in the city began. To have a landmark like that uh, with so many stories, uh, I would have loved to have been there, been a, the fly on the wall, when the first group met at that tree and then when the last group met at the tree. Just to see the beginning and the end of that part of history for that tree. Spiritual strength was what really guided many of those folks that uh, made those journeys and uh, started creating uh, community even here. The three churches that were associated with the Underground Railroad in London, two that still stand, uh, were all near the railroad in, in Soho, and, uh, and that area of London was the black area town back then. Many blacks moved from the tree and settled into their new lives in the growing city. Their hard work and faith landed them all different kinds of jobs, from the town crier to property owners, farmers, firemen, blacksmiths, including actors. But it wasn't until more than a hundred years later, after the first free slaves arrived, that the black community had grown to a sizable number. And it was then, in the late 1940s, that members of my own family decided to celebrate our own shared history in the city with the first of many Emancipation Days. It was held here at Springbank Park, and it was called then the Colour Picnic. The history of Emancipation Day and also what it represents in London is something that we don't often highlight or, or talk about or uh, give, give the emphasis that it should. The early celebrations organized by my ancestors had a huge response with blacks from all over the region coming to celebrate together. My first one I would say was I was, I was about three. I could look as far as the eye could see down in Springbank and you could see black and brown people on both sides of Springbank Park sitting at picnic tables. And there were 400 uh, people coming from all parts of southern, southwestern Ontario, as well as our own community. Every year they looked for that Negro picnic, the colored picnic, which they had every year. They're meeting old friends from Toronto, Windsor, Chatham. I think a few of them came from Detroit. Actually, it was like a big family gathering. You know, every year they came. What I used to look forward to that, that time of year was the Emancipation Day picnic and uh, the Jerry Lewis telethon. It was catered to us because it was all about games. I mean, there'd be sprints uh, for all different age groups. And uh, even though I tried to run in the older kids' age groups a lot of the time, it was, it was a fun time. It was like mini Olympics for all us kids. When we were younger, I was 10 years old at the time, and I, was, I just knew we were going to a big picnic. Springbank was an a excellent place to go, especially for the younger people. Uh, now, there, we had baseball games going on, but for, for some of the younger ones, we went over and had a train ride. You just have the train rides. It was like the best outing in the summertime. I was out there just as, as a kid, like everybody else, celebrating the day and our families together and having fun. Mom and grandma and 
everyone else putting all the time in together. I, I really didn't know about that at the time, but you know, later on you do. It means to me when we were running it that we were continuing on with the legacy that was left there. A, a celebration for what emancipation stands for and for everybody gathering to, together. And it was a happy time. We were a big community of both black and white people. After nearly 40 years of celebrating Emancipation Day in London, many from our community have passed on or have moved away. And eventually, the celebration stopped for a number of years. However, in 2013, I took it upon myself to rebirth the Emancipation Day in London, this time centering it around the Meeting Tree, a living tribute to the first blacks that escaped from slavery and found freedom here. In 1982, before my grandmother passed away, she told me, one day, Justine, you're gonna organize the Emancipation Day celebration. You know what, she was right. My great-grandparents started it, then my grandmother, then my parents, and then me here at the tree. That was actually my first Emancipation Day celebration I have ever attended. So for me, it was very special. What made it really special was the meeting place where we met, the tree. You know, people gather, whether it's sitting on logs or around the fence or, you know, huddled near the tree. And you really feel just a sense of connection to not only nature, but to our history. It was a safe, welcoming place. You could definitely feel that. It's such a magnificent uh, tree. Uh, it just so stands out when you see it. It's very hard not to just stand there and marvel at it. I just found it interesting that, you know, so many people were drawn to it. The, the history uh, of the land is embedded in the ground and the, the roots of the tree spread into the ground and so does the history it brings with it. Hearing about London and hearing that it was such an integral part of the whole Underground Railroad. It's an important day in providing knowledge and education and understanding of past histories, particularly those which you know, when I was growing up were not prominent within the histories that we might learn about through schools. We're able to imagine the people that, that came and how they were able to meet and, and in a safe place and feel safe. And the walk back and forth was just a, like a tiny fragment of what the original people who, who arrived would have gone through. A place that is actually a sacred place where people maybe first experienced true freedom. The freedom of these people were, and they came to a new, tr new life. And to see that something that is hundreds of years old is still living, still has significance, still is a part of the history of London. It made me very proud to know that this is London's contribution to Canadian history. The singing and just being in the forest and the kind of light coming through and you cannot recreate that moment and you only get that moment at Emancipation Day. So where do we go from here? London is far more diverse city now than it has been 20 years ago. And while Emancipation Day celebrates freedom from slavery for the black community in North America, it has grown into a symbol for freedom itself. A freedom that all of us deserve, no matter one's color. Celebrating, you know, with Emancipation Day is the fundamental right of humans to be free. Um, and part of that is acknowledging that there were times and there are times in which people are not. You don't want kids to forget that once their ancestors or their friends' ancestors were once enslaved. You don't want people to forget anything that made how we live today possible. It's good to have insight into the experience of other people. It uh, reaffirms what we all have to fight for, what we all have to stand for. As tolerant and multicultural as we are becoming here in London, it's important to note that the fight for equality and freedom isn't over yet. If anything, it's even more important now, and it's a fight we all have to take on to protect our future generation. Somebody's tied at home, the kids are tied at home. 
That's where racism starts. Don't play with that girl or boy because they're not the same color as you. They came from a different country than you came from. And that's where it starts. As soon as they see the color of your skin, even though you're born here and you're Canadian 100%, they don't understand why you're here. I think when I grew up in the city, the, the teachings that I heard through, through my education didn't really um, directly tell those histories. And, and I think it's important as a community that those that are black, they feel represented. There's no hiding place on the kingdom side. No hiding place. No hiding place. Oh, the it is clear to me that Emancipation Day is just one part of a changing narrative a celebration of the sacrifices and the struggles of the past, but also a message of hope for a better tomorrow. One where everyone in our city is valued equally, no matter their complexion. It is a message my family and I have worked so hard for years to portray. And it's one that I know in my heart will always be part of the celebration here at the Meeting Tree. I invite you to join us next year to gather here at the Tree and become part of the positive change we want in London to be a family. I think that even in my life today, I can see the differences. We're all the same color. We're just different shades. Canada's far from being perfect, but it's a pretty darn good place. <laughs>